here we are with uh, episode episode 59 and it, we're calling this manual therapy take three um a topic which uh is is always popular uh, there's, there's clearly still an appetite for it uh if you haven't listened to our previous uh two episodes on this they are episodes 10 back on the 1st of february 2018 and episodes 21 on the 19th of april 2018 and um we're going to be referring to those as, as we go through i think it's fair to say so if you haven't listened to those go back at some point and listen to them and i think the really cool thing is that we've got um delighted to have dave cashley on who I, i'm a fan of i've heard him speak at conferences i like how he approaches things i like how he explains things i think he's very balanced and when you look at our previous manual therapy um guests they've all been really different personalities as well we've got on episode 10 we had ian lenane and, and and ted jedniak and, and if you know both of those guys you'll know they're very different in the way they they uh sort of uh, approach uh, approach life in general um one of them is very calm and mild mannered and one's very bold and brash and i'll let you work out which is which but they also have slightly different opinions on manual therapy believe it or not even though they're both very very pro manual therapy and then in episode 21 we had uh, none other than adam meekins who makes uh, no secret of the fact that he is not uh, pro manual therapy he's very anti manual therapy and we're going to touch on some of the things he said and i guess give give Dave a, a right to reply to some of those. I think he's probably listened to that episode as well. So Dave, thanks for joining us. And, and maybe you could just tell everyone what, uh, you know, what, what sort of uh, persona you bring to the manual therapy world compared to the three uh, guests that we've had already and, and just your general sort of approach to these things. Are you very, very strongly spoken like some people? Are you much more calm and do you like to sit and take it all in? How do you like to sort of um, take in what is always a really, for some reason, uh, potentially controversial topic? Well, thanks for the invite. I'm really kind of the, the kind of knee-jerk reactionary type guy. Uh, so <clears throat> it's it's hard. It's a, it's a very emotive topic, isn't it? And and people are either really for it or really against it. And there's not much to be gained when you get those kind of frictions. So we've got to make an effort to kind of try and understand where other people are coming from and, and get some concept that that as, as, as enthusiastic as we are about this, if you can't back it up with the science, you need to question it. Not to say you need to ditch it, but you definitely need to question it and you need to think, is this the best for my patient? Is this the, the most evidence-based approach I can take? And sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. So I try and check myself a lot, but I am an enthusiastic advocate for, for manual therapy. I think that would be fair to say. Perfect. A, a beautiful balance, it sounds like. So um, we'll, we'll just get stuck straight in. And uh, Craig, I don't have a screen in front of me. So mid conversation, if anyone pops up with a comment that, that timing wise is, is the right thing to interrupt, please, please do interrupt me. But we'll just get stuck into one of my observations when I re-listened to episode 10 with Ian and Ted. Uh, just just in the last few days um, and I hadn't realized at the time probably because I was part of the talk but but when I listen back it's it's clear that they're very much both advocates of it as you know but they approach their thought pro their, their thought process as to the, the potential mechanisms of effect feel like they're quite different um, Ian was was certainly leaning much more towards it being a strong sort of neuromodulatory effect uh, and I'm not saying Ted disregarded that as a, as a mechanism but you could hear from the comments he made he was sort of more of the belief that you could you were repositioning joints into a more anatomically normal or, or optimal position um i wonder if i could get your your take on on those two sort of uh, sort of points of view and if, if they are indeed opposing if you can hold both opinions at the same time or basically where you sit on that on that sort of seesaw of how this stuff potentially works sure I think as podiatrists, quite often, we're, we're just mechanically minded. And, and sometimes we may be guilty of not, not giving the neurology behind things as much thought as we could. And I, I think our first kind of go-to might be to look at how something works, which is fine. And there are certainly mechanical elements of manual therapy, no question about that. Are we putting a, something back into place? I think that's a really weak analogy. I think it's really poor. Um, for me, it doesn't work. And, and I'm not really sure that that's what Ted was getting at either. I think he's more talking about restoring functionality rather than position. Um, and I understand that and I get that. And for me, that analogy might be something like 
you know, if you have a rusty garden gate, it's maybe in the right position, but only for one given moment in its function, you know, if that makes sense. So, so it may look like it's in the right place, but functionally for most of its gate cycle, see what I did there? That was good, wasn't it? Gate nice, cycle. nice, nice. Uh, <laughs> most of its gate cycle, it's, it's, it's dysfunctional, so its timing is poor. And I think that's where Ted leans, although obviously t- Ted can speak for himself. And I think it's true that there are some elements of manipulation which give those type of benefits. I think they're fleeting, and I think they're certainly not the whole story. And it's a bit like, you know, there's a lot of research going back in the 70s and 80s that showed that manipulation increased temperature. And I think, yeah, maybe it does, but so what? You know, and I think that's maybe the, the, the same thing here about, you know, mechanical realignment. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. I don't think it's that important. I think the, the, the golden ticket is in the neurology. Um, what I would have to say categorically from my point of view is we are not putting bones back in place. That's definitely what we don't do. You know, so this idea that, oh, I've slipped a disc and, you know, my chiropractor popped it back in. That's just nonsense. And uh, the benefit for me is to be had in the neurological feedback and responses that we that we get to treatment. And some of that, those two things kind of sit together in some in some way. Way back in the dark ages, Lewitt was able to show that uh, joint with arthrofibrosis, so any kind of adhesion inside the joint, suffer from what, what we call this didokinesis. So this is basically an inability of the joint to move and return to its neutral position. So we, we know that with an adhesion or any kind of uh, arthrofibrosis in a joint, that failure occurs. And what he was also able to demonstrate was that manipulation restored that dysfunction. So, there was, so what we got was a joint that was then able to return itself back to a good neutral position, so, so optimal functional position. But that's not looking at taking something out of place and putting it in place. It's really about improving function rather than position. So from a mechanical point of view, I would say we can improve function, but predominantly the benefits are to be had from a neurological change that we get. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect. And, and terms that we hear, terms that we hear a lot, um, you know, from from often clinicians doing doing manual therapy. Terms like um, subluxation, or I've heard I've, I've certainly heard people talking about resetting the talus. For you know, as as a term, based on your description that you've just said, are they terms that you are uncomfortable with? I think subluxation is is unhelpful because uh, and subluxation comes from the chiropractic world and what they term as subluxation and what we would understand as a medical subluxation are two entirely different things and it would have been quite helpful if they'd invented a new word <laughs> rather than hijack an existing one so that creates a <laughs> lot of confusion you know and the chiropractors even further will start to talk about the subluxation complex because you're talking about interarticulation between a number of facet joints and so to think of that as a, as a subluxation is really unhelpful yeah so while i think the entity that they're describing exists i think the nomec- the nomenclature muddies the waters and it really doesn't mm. help resetting i often talk about resetting the neurology you know because we want it to to reboot you know, that, that's what we're trying to do. So I'm kind of okay with that. If we talk about resetting the talus, and the talus is obviously unique in the body in that it doesn't have any muscle attachment. So there is some argument to say that we do actually get some kind of rotational disposition of the talus uniquely. Um, on thin ground, suggesting that. And given its unique position in the body, you know, I, I think we do well to look at um, paradigms which explain what's going on in any given joint. So again, my interest would be what happens here neurologically. That's that's the, the name of the game for me. Yeah. 
And, yeah. and just on that note, and I know Craig and I have spoken about this before, and we just feel like this has been you know, decades and decades that people have been doing this stuff. And, um, and like what you described there, you know, the talus is unique. And, and it seems like on, on, surface, on the surface, at least, a fairly simple research study to do where you could you could take some metrics and measurements apply some manipulations and then relook at those i'm not aware of any studies that have been done um uh, correct me if i'm wrong if, if there are some and if there aren't why aren't those studies being done why aren't people churning out the uh, the the research is it is it not as methodologically easy as i'm i'm assuming or is there another reason there are some big difficulties. There, there have been some low-level studies done. Um, Neild, for example, did one on, on the ankle, looking pre- and post-manipulation at dorsiflexion changes. Unfortunately, he looked at asymptomatic ankles and found no change pre- and post-manipulation. To me, that's not a huge surprise because it's asymptomatic. It's already doing everything it should do. There's no reason for the body to change anything. So it's not a surprise that there's no change. Uh, Howie Dunenberg did a nice paper which almost exactly the same, but with uh, symptomatic ankles and found a change in the, in the range of motion post manipulation. Problem with his study is that his control group, he had effectively pinched from another study, you know? So not the best science, okay? But, but a hint that maybe something, something good is going on, but poor science, I'd, con I'd confess. Having said that, I'm just, uh, Finish my own RCT looking at Morton's neuroma, which maybe we'll talk about later. And had I known the, the time and financial investment that would have re required of me, I can honestly say I never would have done it. So <laughs> I think it's really tough to get people into the research field, you know, because it's expensive, it's time consuming, it's frustrating. And at the end of the day, the vast majority of manual therapists are working in private practice. So the, the wherewithal even to do a big, profound study is lacking. Having said that, there was a massive study in the UK, the BEAM trial, which I think we'll, we'll talk about later, um, which looked at, at manual therapy, both in the NHS and in private practice. And it was a really interesting study. So there is research going on. Um, I think when it comes to foot and ankle, if you think about the number of people who are specifically manual therapists, they're quite a small group. If you think about those who are specifically manual therapists for the foot and ankle, you could count them on one, one hand, you know? So finding someone in there who's keen to do the research is definitely a challenge. But for sure, the honest to get the research out there is on us. Um, so that's definitely something we need to address. And I think we are addressing. Um, Brantingham has published 20 or 30 papers on extremity manipulation of the lower limb. So, and he's also done um, a number of literature reviews that he's published on them as well. I think he did a Cochrane review actually on it. That could be wrong. So it is happening. But yeah, it would be nice to be on a grand scale. But somebody's got to put the money up. So, you know, that's the bottom line, isn't it, with any research? But yeah, yeah it is always unfortunate. Okay, good. Yeah. Right, Craig, anything coming in well, from Facebook we need to address or can we move on? There, there is that elephant in the room that I think you and I might have liked to have avoided today, but a question has come Someone's up. mentioned the cuboid already. Yeah. Who was it? Who was it? Guess who? It's Toby. No, not quite Ian Riley. <laughs> so, Ian oh, has Riley. Said, so Ian has said, so there is no such thing as a sublux cuboid then. So we might <laughs> as well press the elephant in the room now rather than avoid it. <laughs> Sorry, Dave, okay. we promised so we wouldn't talk to, it. To, to, address that, hmm. to address that, we need to come back to, yeah, what is a subluxation? And if we are talking about medical subluxation, as in a mini dislocation, there's no such thing as a sublux cuboid. Absolutely. If we're talking about a chiropractic subluxation complex, we're in a different ballpark. And what we're talking about there then is, is there loss of motion around the cuboid? Yep, we can find that. Is there pain on palpation? Yep, we can find that. Is there dysdidokinesis? Yep, we can find that. So 
are the indications there for manipulation of a cuboid problem? Yes. Is it a sublux cuboid? No. Did that just muddy it further? <laughs> uh, That's just because no, I think no. this is wallpaper, isn't it? He's taking the hump. <laughs> No, I mean, uh, Craig and I have both made our, our thoughts known on uh, our, our position, uh, pardon the pun, on uh, sublux, sublux cuboids. Um, I, I'll bring up what we said last time. I can't remember whether it was episode 10 or episode 21, where we talked about our, our biggest concern isn't that people get pain in and around the cuboid, because we know they do. It isn't that manual therapy may not be an appropriate thing to do and it may not help because we know it does we, we we've all seen this in our own clinics we've heard the stories it's 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 the two plus two equals five it's someone coming in with pain you're doing something and then that that proving it was sublux but but more than that i've definitely seen a few things in the forums where they they, they sort of half present a case like you often do on the forums. so you know a runner came in and they're getting lateral midfoot pain um, what do you think? And then the first person that comes up that's been on a manual therapy course perhaps recently says, oh, that sounds like cuboid syndrome. You know, you need to mob that. You need to manip that. And, and you know, like, well, hang on a minute. Like, this could be a stress fracture, uh, for, example, for example. So it, our biggest for concern, sure. Craig, and I know we share a similar opinion on this, has always been that not that, not that, that manual therapy to the cuboid can't be very useful because we know it can. It's, it's do people dive to that too quickly? What, 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 what would you, what would your um, sort of thoughts be on that? Is that, is that something you've, you've noted? Probably. Trouble is when you're a hammer, everything's a nail, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe I dive too quickly for, for manual therapy. I think that's, that's possible, probable. Um, I think we could say there are many, many podiatrists who dive too quickly for the orthotic prescription, you know, we, we all just love what we're comfortable with, you know, and, and I've been in many, a, many a situation where an orthotic's gone into a shoe really quite inappropriately. Um, <laughs> and this is a problem, isn't it, with, with, with this kind of Facebook, I mean, I've had phenomenal um, information gleaned off of Facebook pages from the likes of Ian Riley and, and Belinda and, and so many more. But that doesn't trump your own clinical skills and your own clinical judgment you know so somebody may be advising that you manipulate this individual the onus is still on you to take that history isn't it and and you know probably 95 percent of our job is history isn't it? A, a good history takes you almost all the way you know and the onus is on us to do that so yes that may be a stress factor so you really ought to rule that out before you manipulate it but Again, I think that that's something that's often thrown, and maybe I just get a little defensive because I feel that's thrown at manual therapists often, as are a number of other things, which are equally true in every other field. You know, I see physios tell, tell them those same thing. Oh well, get out and stretch it, or, or you know, get active. Well, well, again, if it's a stress fracture, that that's probably not a great idea. You know, so I, I think that exists in all spheres. And maybe yeah. sometimes we're, we're just keen to help our colleagues and, and give advice that we assume they'll censor for themselves. We hope. Yeah. Let's, um, let's use that as a nice linkage into uh, some, of the, some of the criticisms that, that is, are often pointed at manual therapy um, that, that do get your back up. And let's give you a right to reply. Um, and I'm not just picking on some of the things that Adam said in... in um, in episode 21, uh, I, I think we can reasonably safely say that people who are strongly against manual therapy for whatever reason all say very similar things. The big ones that I can sort of note um, and, and sort of mention, mention b uh, bigger ones if I've left them out, but the big ones I can sort of note is that um, there's a concern that, that it makes people or, or instills the belief that they aren't robust, instills the belief that they are fragile. It, it makes them feel like they need fixing, which is a, a, certainly a movement that, that within the physiotherapy world very much that, that they're trying to, to move away from. And, uh, and on that note, I've even seen some people say it, it makes it, it makes them it reduces their self -effic efficacy and the language used at time of delivery can be very uh, fear inducing, nocebic. It can make people catastrophize. It can make people kinesophobic. I think I hope I've 
I hope I've covered most of the ones. I know you've heard all of them. Um, you know, these are some of the things I think you're probably referring to when you say manual therapy gets gets sort of bad press and things. Um, let me give you your right to reply on whether you think there's any validity in any of those accusations, whether you think there's a strong argument against them, um, and then we'll see where the conversation takes us. Well, this is one of those areas where um, we get to turn the tables a wee bit, and I, I'd like to ask, can we have the reference for that? Because... <laughs> That research hasn't been done, right? And the, the, this is just a... I get a motive on this one because it's a slander, you know, and, and it's inaccurate, you know. In actual fact, if we look at the research, uh, there's research by Bernadette Murphy and more recently, 2008, Engiston, I think? Ellingston, Ellingston, 2008. In fact, Ellingston's study was really interesting. What he did is he took people with low back pain and people with no pain, and he showed them videos of strenuous low back lifting. And what he said to them is, at the end of the video, you're going to have to do what this guy does. And they were able to map people's perception of how sore that was going to be and how kinesophobic these individuals were. And then one of the groups in his study were given manual therapy and the study was run again. And what he actually found was that those in the group who received the manual therapy were less kinesiophobic. So they were more inclined to move. They were more inclined to work. They were more inclined to be unafraid of the strain. So for me, that, that research put, puts that to bed really quite nicely. But also my own clinical experience puts it to bed as well, because if I have someone who comes into me and says, you know, this ankle's messing with my golf game, I can't, I can't play golf. It's not in my interest to make them kinesiophobic. It's in my interest to get them back on the golf course. You know, so my goal is to make them move. My goal with, with any manipulation really is to make someone move better, be less afraid of movement i.e. be more independent, not less. And we know, for example, that when it comes to proprioceptive feedback from a joint, the proprioceptors at the end range of motion are those which kickstart the nociceptive response for manipulation. So we're looking to maximize movement. That's the name of the game. When you think about the uh, Meltzak and Wells work back in the 60s, 65 to 69, I think, especially. And they looked at the gate control theory of pain. You know, and they looked at, well, okay, you burn your hand on the radiator, you do this. And you do this because as long as that's moving, you're not hurting. Because motion closes the gate to nociception. So the goal of the manual therapy is to make people less kinesophobic, not more. So it doesn't make sense as an argument that somehow we're catastrophizing and telling people they can't move. You know, it's, it's absolutely back to front. It makes no sense. And there's definitely no reference for it. So, you know, I don't buy it. Is that fair enough? Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, I think it comes down to, I know we've, we've, we've spoken about this, um, I know, is, is how it's sold no and that doesn't i don't mean that in, in how the practitioner intentionally sells it but what the what the uh, sort of uh, perception of what's being done and the mechanism behind what's being done is so i think the the biggest concern that the physios that i've spoken to about this isn't that at the time you know, even patients that, that absolutely love the way manual therapy feels at the time because those effects are often short-lived or uh, they when they leave if they've left with the belief that they have been you know, had a, had a bone that's misplaced, put back into position. And that may be no fault of the practitioner, of course. That could just be the patient's belief of what's yeah. just happened. Then sure. the concern is that later down the line, they feel, you know, whenever they feel some sensitivity, they're out of place again. And then catastrophization, kinesophobia, uh, you know, lack of robustness, fragility, that, that kicks in. So it's almost like a, a delayed, it's like patients love it at the time, but are we setting them up for, for an increase in these things later? And I think you've already covered it. It comes back to the patient's belief about what's being done. Does that feed into the way you describe this to patients? Because I know, I know, for example, I've, 
I've seen patients, I've never, ever used the word overpronation in clinic, never, just because it's a word I don't like. And they'll, they'll come back in two, three weeks later and they'll say to me, oh, do you remember when you told me I was overpronating? Uh, and I'm like, wow, that is exactly what they've taken from the, the dialogue. And, and that's on me to reflect yeah. on how I communicate. Do you find that you use very specific language or you avoid, very, you, you avoid certain language to try and really feed into the, the, the patient's belief system that they're not being repositioned? And, and that's why you don't see kinesophobia. Am I, am I making my point clear? I'm not sure. I think I'm sure, I think it, but hopefully you get what I mean. Language, yeah, the language you use is crucial. And I think sometimes even the language you don't use is crucial because patients come in with a preconceived, you know, they've Googled it already, you know, and we only need to look on the, you know, the plantar fasciitis forums to see that people will take the advice of other sufferers and, and, and well-meaning friends before they'll take any professional advice, you know. So, so by the time they get in the chair in your room, they're already heavily researched on what's going on and a lot of what they've read is is it's probably bunkum you know and part of the job of the therapist is to to untangle all of that isn't it and say that you know we're not doing x y and z you know we're, we're not putting bones back in place we're not um saving you from being in the wheelchair but sometimes you, you need to be explicit about what you are and aren't doing but there's something I do need to pick you up on as well, because it's another one of, of those myths that the outcomes of manipulation are short lived. And that, that, that simply isn't true. Um, and this is, and, and I remember from Adam's uh, podcast, he talked about, you know, is it really worth it for that short benefit? Well, certainly my study where, where we had uh, six weeks of manipulation once a week for six weeks, uh, and then we followed people for a full year. Okay, at the end of that year, they were still pain free. So that that's not a short lived outcome. Um, unfortunately, I've been too lazy to publish that yet. It should have been out by now, but it'll be it's imminent. We can say, okay, but that's certainly not a short lived outcome. But then when we go back to the Beam trial, which was a study for low back pain, comparing standard GP care to exercise and to manipulation at a one year follow up. They found that exercise and manipulation beat standard GP care at the three month period. But at the one, at the one year period, manipulation had a greater benefit than exercise. That's not what we're being told, but that's the reality of the science. So it's not short lived benefit. But but Dave, it has a huge no subjective short lived element, but that's not short lived benefit. They're not the same. Sure. But but Dave, could some of the allegations about the short term benefit be related to the way that manipulation is sold by some clinicians? You need you need to come in once, after the, once a month Absolutely. for the rest of your life, and I think maybe that's the problem: is that sales process is giving that perception. Oh, one hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have any any disagreement with that at all. Um, and I'm not going to defend that position. But what I am going to say is that that happens everywhere. You know, you need these customer products when, in actual fact, a slimline or you know EVA would have done the job perfectly well. But you can't sell that for three hundred quid. You know, so that happens everywhere, and that that that's unfortunate to say the least. But um, and I think that ties in with what Ian was saying. We, we need to modulate our language. We need to agree clear goals with our patients right from the outset. And for me, these clear goals are about, let's get you back to where you want to be as quickly as we can get you there. And we may well talk about maintenance. We may well talk about keeping you as fit and as healthy and keeping your podiatric health at its optimum. Absolutely. Uh, and I don't have a problem with, with that kind of maintenance approach. But I do have a problem with suggesting that without this intervention, you somehow can't cope. I mean, that, that, that doesn't hold up to any scrutiny. It's a sharp practice. But I, but I think it happens everywhere. Yeah, I think that's a fair comment. Um, let's 
move you sort of touched on some of your research already so let's move into that if we may and give you give you a chance to talk about that um particularly your work in the world of of neuroma um firstly because i think it's a few a few people message me saying you've got to ask dave about neuroma because obviously they've they've either read your your paper you've published on it or they've seen posts of yours in the forum and also the, the general groundswell from, from, that i get the impression of is that neuroma is not particularly liked by many people it's a bit of a beast yeah. it can be a bit of a beast to treat i mean you know if uh, if you don't have the ability to inject or, or, or image them and you don't do manipulations it kind of leaves you with footwear footwear advice plus minus orthoses and um more people i speak to than not say that orthoses can help but it's a bit of it, it's a bit of hit and miss just as many people say that it feels it now feels worse because the shoe feels tighter because now there's something in it that wasn't in it before so i think having a treatment option another treatment option for neuroma is something that really really uh, excites people so can you talk us a bit a bit about you know manipulations uh, mobilizations for neuroma what what it looks like clinically what the sort of thought process behind it is what your research is 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 showing us and and how people can sort of then take that into into practice Sure. Um, so from, from my point of view, what, what I found clinically was that neur neuromas were responding well to manipulation. But it, it was, um, and I, I've got to hold my hands up here and say that I'm not a particularly good orthotic uh, prescriber. And I found pretty much 100% of the time I would fail with my orthotic prescription for Morton's neuroma. So when you're faced with that, you, you, you've got to come up with something else, you know. And the chiropractors I was working with, with the two or three cases that we, we did together, they got great success with it. So obviously I'm going to go down that route. So that's, that's why I started looking at this. And part of the, the diagnostic workup for me with the, with the neuroma as well, I mean, I'll do the usual kind of Mulder's click test, plan a digital nerve stretch test, all of these things. I don't really see a need for imaging because the, if I'm not going to operate, I think the diagnosis is pretty safe from a purely clinical diagnosis. There's two good papers, uh, one by Pastides and I think the other one's Sharp. And Cloak and Grease also touched on this as well. Uh, Pastides and Sharp both compared clinical tests to radiological tests. And they found that the two clinical tests, Mulder's click test and the plantar digital nerve stretch test, were more sensitive than ultrasound and more sensitive than MRI and more sensitive than ultrasound and MRI combined. So, you know, sometimes we, we've got this kind of over-reliance on the technology and we think, we think you know, that, that's where it's at. If we didn't see on ultrasound, it doesn't exist. And, and I'll... Ultrasound, I think, has something like a 17% false negative and 20% false positive for Morton's neuroma. So the clinical tests are a much safer diagnosis than the radiological ones. So that, that's something in our favour. That's good news for our profession because most of us don't have access to those radiological tests, so not easy access. So the diagnosis is pretty sound in the clinic. What I've found is I tend to back that up with a little tool called an algometer. So this is what I use to tell me that a joint is not functioning as it should. And an algometer simply measures the amount of pressure a joint can withstand before it registers pain. Okay, so we know that in the MTPJs, it should take 5.5 kilograms of pressure before we register pain. And what I found with my neuroma patients was absolutely consistently, so well into the 90%, the third MTPJ would take considerably less stress. So that means it takes less than its neighbours, but it also took less than the counterpart on the asymptomatic foot. So that led me to the conclusion that we have dysfunction of some description in the third MTPJ. Okay, by manipulating the joints either side of the neuroma, we saw an improvement. So, what I'm postulating is that again we have an arthrofibrosis at the third MTPJ, 
And that creates that this diadokinesis we talked about, that failure to return to that neutral position. That in turn causes the irritation of the plantar digital nerve. And that was actually um, Morton's original contention. That is what he said was going on. And we kind of moved away from that and we looked at potential other causes. But I think, that, me personally, I've come full circle and I, I think he was spot on. I think that is the problem. So what I'm doing now is manipulating those two metatarsals either side of the neuroma. So always the third, sometimes the second, more commonly the fourth and getting good results. In the RCT we've just run, what we did was we ran two, two groups, uh, one with steroid injection as their treatment, one with manipulation. And what we found was that the steroid group got a slightly better response early days, uh, so in, in the first six weeks. By three months, the manipulation group had overtaken the steroid group. By nine months, the steroid group were by and large back to uh, pre-steroid injection pain levels, where the manipulation group had stayed largely pain-free. So at a year follow-up, almost our entire group of manipulation patients were pain-free. Now, there's a caveat to that because we had about a 15% 20% probably actually drop out from that group. So there's a, there's a not an insignificant dropout number, but for those that stay, stayed in that we could follow all the way through, they're almost all completely pain-free, which I think given historically how much we struggle with Morton's neuroma, I think even if we include the 20% dropout, it's a pretty good result. Yeah. Take it just to way. clarify, Dave. That, so that's that, what we're doing. That, that's what I was saying. Yeah. Sorry, Dave. Just to clarify, that you, you you said that'll be published soon, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. So we're yeah. writing up at the minute. Sure. Yeah. Now you also mentioned when just pr previously a couple of other papers. Can you come back at some stage and just post them in the comments to the to this chat so others can have a look at them? Sure. Yeah. But, no problem um, at all. I'd like to get your opinion on this yeah. paper though. Is this paper any good? That, that, that's, that's probably the most awesome paper you're going to read in your entire <laughs> clinical career. <laughs> no, look, I'll, I'll link to that paper that, as well. That Linda Cochran is awesome. She, she's good. Yeah, I mean, it's just a case, a case series, but um, I just was doing a hunt around. So I'll link to that. No, so so it, it is really just a case series of, look, this is what we did in clinic. It looks pretty good. And really that was published as nothing more than a justification for this is why we're going on to do an RCT because this looks promising. But there's a lot of things that look promising when you don't have it up against a control, isn't there? You know? Sure. So, yeah. so we need to put it can against I, a control. Can which, I just ask a quick question about the, the uh, I've not heard of an algometer before, so forgive me if this is a foolish okay. question, but you, you mentioned the, the difference uh, in that third MTPJ in the symptomatic uh and i don't know whether what your thoughts on whether that was, was was cause or effect but also i'd love to know post manip and with that positive outcome of, of pain change and pain relief long-term pain relief have you re-measured that 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 third mtpj measure and has it gone back up to 5.5 yeah so what what we do craig actually maybe you can do a quick google image search for uh, already, already done it for <laughs> Yes. There you go. Spot on. So that third one along, that's what I use. The third and fourth ones along are the ones I use. That one and its neighbor. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I use this one here. Was we measured immediately pre-manipulation and we measured immediately post-manipulation. Okay. And we get a very definite shift from pre to post-manipulation. What we haven't done now yet is look at how large that shift is, you know, immediately pre and post manipulation. We will do that. that that'll be one of the, the subsequent papers to come out, but it'll be some way down the line. But if you think we, we uh, saw those people six weeks in the trot and did pre and post measurement each time. So we, we have a chart of how that behaved, not only immediately pre and post, but also over a six week period. And then again, we measured it at three months, six months, nine months, and a year. 
So we have a graph of how that pain behaved over the entire year and how the pressure algometry scores read over the year. And what we found is quite closely, and in actual fact, I have I've another paper published comparing VAS and PTM. I don't, I don't know where that is, but I'll put that up in the, in the case notes as well. And what we found is that VAS and algometry scores have a very tight inverse relationship. And as the VAS score comes down, the, the pressure threshold score or the algometry score goes up in equal measure and that it stays consistent. So in those patients in our neuroma study who were registering a, a VAS score of less than 10, 10 from 100, their algometry score will be up above the 5.5 kilograms. And we found that really, really consistently. Those two measurements match each other really beautifully which is always nice and, and fairly rare in the research world. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your, what's your take? Is the, is the pain or the sensitivity causing the change in score or is the change in, in, in score causing the pain or sensitivity? Or is, it, is that, I mean, you may not have the data to answer that, but what's your, what's your personal, um, you know, if, I'm, if I hold a gun to your head and ask you which way round is that, what's your, what's your gut feeling? Okay, I, I think the failure of motion so the failure of normal motion, if you like, creates the pain. Does that answer your question? Is that what you're asking? Are you asking, yeah, are, are we shielding the joint because it's sore or is it sore because it's not moving? Yeah, I, I, I don't know what I'm asking. I'm new to the algometry and I'm looking forward to this paper because I hate neuroma. Um, I, my... I okay. consider myself quite good with orthoses uh, intervention when I do it, mm-hmm. although, be it, although yeah. I'm conservative. Yeah. But even as someone who considers himself quite good, my, my success rates with neuroma are akin to yours. So um, I, I await okay. your paper. That's uh, yeah. <laughs> It might just be me as well, but I await that paper with, with very, very much of interest. Um, let's, talk, um, let's talk a bit about... Um, We've already talked about sort of, you know, how you, the things you use to, you know, in clinic, that one of the things you use at manual therapy, Thorby and Neuroma. What are the, what are the top other three things? We've asked, what we've asked previous guests is what they're using it for, but also, I guess, the things they use it for, but the, the contraindications, the things they would, they would very much be, be reticent to use it for. Do you mind giving us your top three of each of those lists? Okay. So I absolutely always use it for cuboid subluxations. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> okay, so I'll use it, obviously, neuromas, 100%. Every neuroma almost, you know, but with some very few exceptions. So absolutely, um, neuromas, that would be my top one. Uh, uh, painful HAV, I quite use it, I use it a lot for. Um, I saw Ted was very brave and... Uh, so I've just been told my internet's cut off. Are you you still yeah, got no, me? Okay, we still got you. I can still hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You still got me? Good. Okay. Yeah. So um, a while back, Ted very bravely stuck his head above the parapet and said he'd seen some realignment of an HAV with, with, with manipulation, with, with you know persevering with a patient. Um, and I can honestly say I've been doing this twenty two years. I've never ever seen that. It may be just because that's not what I'm looking for. I don't know. But but I would certainly never claim that. Uh, what I would claim is that I get consistently good results in terms of pain relief for painful HEV. So it would be my go-to for those patients. So maybe those who either can't have the corrective surgery or don't want the corrective surgery, can't stand Ian Riley's jokes, you know, that, that group of patients... I'll, I'll Everyone. My, uh, <laughs> I use uh, manual therapy there to good effect. So that would be my top two. And my third one I would use uh, with your kind of Baxter's neuritis and plantar fasciopathy patients. But in those cases, I don't use it in isolation. In the first two, I use it in isolation. But but in in those plantar fasciitis, Baxter's neuritis type pains. Uh, I'll use it in conjunction with strapping and exercise and, and, and sometimes even orthotics if I'm feeling brave. But they would be my kind of, my favourites to get my teeth into. 
where I absolutely wouldn't use it. Sorry, what are you going to say, Craig? Oh, no. I was just going to say, I, again, I, I use it a lot for those achy first MPJs like you do. The other time I tend to use a lot of those um, sort of non-specific chronic pain following a long-term after an ankle sprain. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it, it just, you, you don't know what it, you just can't put your finger on it. But they, I just find they, but then again, you know, it, it's in my experience for the, what that's worth is the other one I'd yeah. use them a lot for. Um, Okay, yeah, no, I, I do use it a lot in that. That's a, and in actual fact, hopefully that's going to be our next research paper. Um, Andrew Gilmore, if you're watching this, you shouldn't be. You should be doing the lit review for that research paper. Um, <laughs> but the, the idea there is we know that with, with those ankle sprains, the, the, the number of people with the original ankle sprain who have a recurrent sprain within the year mm -hmm. is a huge number. And in my head, I'm convinced that that's because of a proprioceptive deficit, which absolutely plays into the ballpark of, of manual therapy. Because as we said earlier, that's where it has its major effect. Mm -hmm. And so what I'd like to do is, is, is run a study there that looks at, okay, those who are rehabbed with manual therapy, does that decrease the incidence of recurrent ankle sprains? And I'd be really quite confident that it will. But that, that, that's where the, our research team are hoping to go next. So that, that's going to be quite interesting. Mm. Hopefully interesting. Yeah. No, okay. um, so you were just about to tell us when you would not, definitely would not use uh, manual therapy for, for people out there. Just, you know, the, the, the red flags, the, the, the contraindications, I guess. Okay. So the contraindications are obviously prosthetic joint. You don't really want to manipulate them. It's not helpful. Uh, suspicion of any uh, uh, fracture or derangement. Um, there's some argument about whether or not you should manipulate during active rheumatoid flare-up. I'm uncomfortable doing it then, and so it's a red flag for me. Now, there's a lot of therapists who I think would would, would poo-poo my stance on that. Um, and maybe it's maybe it's ignorance about those diseases on my part, but but for me that's a that's a red flag too. Any soft tissue injury means that we can't manipulate in the direction of stress on that tissue. So it's not to say that we can't manipulate, but we need to be mindful about what other structures are involved, what other structures are potentially damaged here, because obviously the last thing we want to do is is increased damage to an already weakened structure but that that in itself is quite quite an interesting uh, position because we we hear a lot from those who are opposed to manual therapy that you know how can you hope to to have a, an effect on soft tissue structures they're so incredibly strong you know it, any any effect is likely to be fleeting and negligible and what that doesn't take into account is how weak pathological tissue is or how weak poorly aligned tissue is. And there's a huge difference in, you know, something that's structurally sound because everything's lying as it should and something that's uh, diminished in strength because of abnormal position. And there's a great paper by Carboy in 2013. He looked at manipulation of the knee for arthrofibrosis, so where we've got adhesions in the knee, which limited the arc of motion of the knee. And he compared it to surgical outcomes. In each case, it was the, the choice of the surgeon whether they went for manual therapy or surgery. And at a two-year follow-up, those who had manual had a 50% larger arc of motion than those who had surgery. So again, you know, we're talking a two-year follow-up there. So that goes back and kind of belies the, the idea that the, the effect of manual therapy is fleeting. It really, really isn't, you know. Also as well, those people have avoided surgery. And the, the complications in the surgical group, not surprisingly, were 300% were greater than the complications in the manual therapy group. And so what, what he was doing there was, was detaching pathological tissue, detaching adhesions, detaching cross linkages. <sighs> which is something that, that quite often it's said it can't be done. And again, I would say, well, we, we've actually got, you know, good reference research to show that it is done. 
So from my point of view, I think uh, sometimes we, we, we are in risk of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, suspecting that X isn't true or Y isn't true. But the, the, the research is pretty good there. I got off on a bit of a tangent there, but... No, okay. no, please do. If you could... Um... If you could post the links to some of those papers um, uh, at, at your leisure, that would be great. Because I know that whenever we talk about papers, uh, certainly if I hear a paper that I haven't ever heard of or certainly read before, I just scribble it down there and I'll go and look for it. But other people, uh, if you could just link to it in the comments, that would be great. Because I know there are people like myself that want to go away and read read more about that. Um, are we okay for one more question, Craig? Yeah, uh, no, you have five, five more minutes here. Yeah. Great. So it's, it's pretty much the closer anyway. And um, it's, it's more of a philosophical question, really. And it's, it's, it's a bit like at the end of a job interview where someone says, tell us where you see yourself in 10 years. Uh, it's one of those horrible kind of futuristic kind of things. But I want to ask you what you think the future for manual therapy is. And, and let me just um, tell you the context in which I'm asking this question. And, and that's that, as we already said, we've talked about um, people being for it and against it. And I don't want it to keep feeling like a us and them kind of argument mm -hmm. but i've certainly noticed um given the, the 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 sort of echo chambers i surround myself in both in you know friendship groups and clinic groups but also in the people you follow in social media it's all a big echo chamber so that's that's obviously a limitation here but i've certainly noticed that my physiotherapy colleagues on the whole are when, when asked where do you see manual therapy within physiotherapy in five years most of them are of the the hope that it is not something they deliver as physiotherapists. And that isn't to say that uh, they're all completely belittling of it and they don't see its effects, but uh, they've often talked about this tiered, this tiered healthcare system, which I think you're, you're familiar with because I think Adam mentioned it, whereby a bit like the way the dentist doesn't clean your teeth. It's still a very important part of, of dental care, but it's not the dentist that delivers it. Uh, they, don't, they don't feel that manual therapy uh, is something a physiotherapist, they hope that manual therapy isn't something that physio is delivering. Um, for all the kind of reasons that, that we've talked about. And when I speak to my, uh, a lot of podiatry colleagues, it's, it's, uh, it feels like it's, a, it's got momentum within our profession. You know, we've got courses that are being taught in it. We've got people upskilling. We've got people adding it to, you know, adding that string to their bow. And, and certainly in five years, you'd hope that we, it's one of, a, uh, one of the tools in our toolbox. I don't know if that's a completely fair representation, but why, if, assuming I am, you know, saying something that's, that's semi-accurate. Why do you think there's that discourse between, you know, where people, let's not call it physio versus podiatry, but why are physio yeah. looking toward looking at manual therapy differently to podiatry right now? What's, what's your take on that? Well, firstly, I'm not, not entirely sure you are looking at it uh, correctly. Um, I work <laughs> that's a, okay. total, <laughs> a total of eight physios <laughs> and they're, split down the middle you know um so ha half are really really keen to develop manual therapy for them and half think it should be put to bed a lot of that comes with you know the, there's an onus on us to be an evidence-based profession as there is with the physios if what you read tells you that you know the evidence for this is weak then you owe, you owe it to your patients to move on the trouble with manual therapy, we, we look around something like palpation, you know, palpation skills. Well, there's lots of evidence out there to say palpation is really not very good. And if that's what you're reading, that's going to make you question, well, if I can't even palpate this correctly, how can I justifiably manipulate it? And that's a fair question. The trouble is what you're inclined to do then is reinforce that by reading more and more of the same. And likewise, for those who are keen on manual therapy, you know, I could quote to you, for example, Lavaza who this year, no, last year, showed that palpation skills with appropriate training led to almost perfect reliability. You know, now, I was about to say the hands-off group, but I, I don't like that term, and I know it's because it, it conjures up, and, it, and that makes it that them and us, you know? And I don't think there's physios anywhere who are not putting their hands on their patients. But, but by saying the hands-off group, that, that, that non-manual therapy group, I think, won't go down that path, you know, won't, won't necessarily read that paper, won't, you know, nothing draws you to that because you do tend to be in that echo chamber, you know. Um, equally, there are two huge studies that showed that palpation skills were very, very poor. And they were jumped on 
as being evidence that we shouldn't be doing. Nobody really looked at any depth in those papers, and, and they were big papers and big studies. Trouble is, one was done by a Canadian chiropractic school, and the other one was done here in the UK by the Anglo-European College of Chiropractic. And they both had uh, very, very poor outcomes for palpation skills. And the trouble is, is they both had uh, students as their subject group. Now, it's not a surprise that students are not good at palpating, you know. I can still remember when I gave my first local anaesthetic at Queen Margaret's because back in the days when I trained, I know you're far too young for the scene, but in my day, we, we stabbed each other, you know, and I can still remember a terrified Kenny Brown sitting on the table while I injected, you know, and I had a great technique and I had him beautifully secure on the table and I inserted that needle so smoothly and I injected 2.2 mil of Scandinest right onto the clinic floor. You know, so your students are not good at things. You know, that's, that's, that's why we're students. So these two papers that, that were hugely trumped as evidence that palpation is poor, you know, when you scratch beneath the surface and say, well, what, what we know is students are not very good at palpation. And that, that's not really news, you know. So I think there's a trouble that, that we kind of reinforce our own our own beliefs rather, rather than challenging them. And I love Craig's... Uh, statement you know i go where the evidence takes me the trouble is with this that there's there's so much evidence on both sides and you can just cherry pick it to your heart's content and i think we all do you know um i love that lavaza study you know other people will love the the, the study and, and i'm sure others could pick holes in that study it's tough it's tough yeah but i think as the evidence comes out if I'm right with my manipulation paper and that stands up to robust peer review and, and, and stands the test of time, I think that will lead us to suggest that, at least in the podiatry world, manual therapy has a place. Uh, I would hope we'll see the same in the, the physio world, but time will tell, I guess. But I, I think it's a growing, a growing uh, part of our it's a it's a it's a string in our bow it's not it's not the whole cookie is it but it's a it's another tool in the box but they definitely the onus is on us to to make it an evidence-based one perfect well i know craig i can see craig i know him by now i know him well enough by now to see when he's getting jittery time wise um god bless you for calling me young by the way and also <laughs> uh it, it's just always a pleasure uh, i speak for craig and i when you talk to someone who's just such a lovely understanding of the evidence base behind their specialism so i've just really enjoyed your time and really appreciate it and um and and your honesty as well it's just it's just refreshing so let me give you an opportunity to uh plug any courses you've got coming up you've given us an hour of your time it's only fair you can you know i know you, you teach this stuff uh countrywide if not worldwide uh, wh wh where can people find out about you your courses if you've if you've lit any kind of fires underneath people who hate neuromas as much as you as we all do um where, where can they find out about you and how to be taught by you i oh, appreciate that thanks very much um we are running courses this year in london nantwich edinburgh and cardiff uh, that, that, that's all that's running for 2019 uh, you can see all of them on my website which is dundeepodiatry.com and you're going to have to scroll right through to the, uh, you know what? I'm going to put a link up in the show notes for that, if that's Perfect. okay. Perfect. That, yeah, that's absolutely. Probably a whole lot easier. But, uh, you know, drop, drop me a line on Facebook if you're interested and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll crack on. And uh, so if you go up there and do our services, and then we should see a link that comes up for, um, yeah, if it loads, it'll come up down there courses for podiatrists underneath the, the four headings there that's us yeah and you should see the courses in there really but I'll, I'll stick a link up as well and craig, uh, craig can you just go back to that profile picture of dave for a second oh uh, okay yeah he, he's already told craig me that, that profile already told picture me that. Is. <laughs> yeah. i, I just it didn't realize stunning. you were such a keen i didn't realize you were such a keen snooker player <laughs> yeah, back in the day. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit dated but i'm i'm definitely not putting up a current one <laughs> well that's that's a good, cool. note to, good note to finish and in case anyone's wondering why i get so much angst when we get near an hour 
the, the podcast version of this has to be under 60 minutes or I have to edit it as part one and part two. So it's a lot more work for me to edit something that goes over 60 minutes. So go, thanks so much. We keep talking here. It's been great. Thanks, Dave. And I think taking this, yes, thank you very much. this episode with our previous two episodes on manipulation, there's quite a valuable resource there on the topic. So um, thanks everyone who's listened, who's watched. Um, if you come back in about 10 minutes, the whole video will be there on Facebook. It'll be on YouTube later today. Um, and the podcast version will be available later today as well. So thanks, David. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, guys. Yes, thanks.